All right, I wanted to say something, I forgot what I wanted to say. Anyway, so this formula is the Einstein specific heat formula. And you can see that this looks pretty much different from, you know, uh, this 3R. You know, it's got temperature dependence and everything. And uh, let's see, you know, how it matches this, you know, Dulong Pettit's law that at high energy, at high temperatures, it should go to 6. And at low temperature, if this is correct, it should go to 0. And of course, it should match in between also, you know. <clears throat> so, oh, let me see, just one thing. Okay. Uh, I'm a little bit faster. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to define Einstein temperature theta E, which is H nu by K. So in terms of theta E, this thing becomes 3R, and H nu by K is a theta E by T whole square, E to the power of theta E by T, divided by E to the power of theta E divided by T, E to the power of theta E divided by T minus 1 whole square. That's my formula here. Yeah? Now at high temperatures, now I, I, I have expanded, I have expanded this thing, you know. We're using that expansion over here. E to the power theta E by T actually equal to 1 plus theta E by T and theta E by T whole square factor of 2 and this goes on. So for high temperature, T is much larger than theta E, you know. Right? <clears throat> so so the secondary the, the 1 by T square term will be really, really small compared to this one. <clears throat> so we have neglected that. And e to power theta E by T, we have approximated as 1 by theta E by T. And then I'm going to put it over here. So I get 3R theta E by T whole square. And this is nothing but 1 plus theta E by T. And this will term would be 1 plus theta E by T. And there's a minus here whole square. One one cancels out. So I have 3R theta E by T whole square. 1 plus theta E by T. And this is simply theta E by T whole square. <clears throat> So this, this cancels out, so you have your 3R, 1 plus theta E by T. So when T approaches infinity, it becomes a very large number, this becomes negligible compared to 1, and your specific heat reduces to 3R. So that's a very good news that Einstein's specific heat does predict correctly at very large temperatures. Now let's see what happens at the low temperature, you know. <clears throat> So at low temperature, T is small compared to this, so this quantity is going to be large. So my, this is how I've written, this is my formula that I've written right here, 3R theta E by T whole square, E to the power theta E by T, uh, what E theta E by T, this is T by the way. Great. Anyway. Already, sometimes it's better not to make any crutches. So this quantity is very large. <clears throat> so if this quantity is very large, so is uh, e to the theta e by 2. I mean, this exponential is going to be large too. So what I have written over here? Already. So we have 3r and we have theta e by t whole square, and that remains the same. And this is your, this thing, you know. So this would because this would be, this is much greater than one, so I just put it equal to e to the power theta e by t, that's all I did over here. And then this and this cancels out, so you're gonna get 3r theta e by t, one over theta e by t, because this this cancels you. And then what I get is 3r is here, I wrote this guy as t divided, Denominator, I wrote it as t divided by theta e whole square. That's how I wrote it. And expanded this guy, which is your 1 plus theta e by t plus 1 over factorial 2 theta e by t whole square plus 1 over factorial 3 theta e by t whole cube and so on and so forth. Yeah. Then I multiply this thing inside. You know, so I get t by theta e whole square plus, if you multiply these two, t, t cancels. So t divided by theta e. And there's going to be factorial 2 only over here because these two terms cancel. 
plus 1 over uh, factorial 3, and theta e divided by t, and so on and so forth, you know. <clears throat> so as t goes to 0, this goes to 0, this goes to 0, and this term goes to infinity. And if this term, all the term goes to infinity, then Cv tends to 0. So that's very good. At high and low temperature, Einstein's specific heat matches the data. But what happens is uh, if uh, somebody takes a carefully detailed, uh, comp makes a detailed comparison of the experimental data, then it shows overall agreement is only approximate. It's not the, I mean, it, it, it matches here, it matches here, but in between, there is some, yeah. some problem. Experimental data, CV varies at TQ at low temperature, okay? Whereas Einstein's uh, theory predicts an exponential variation, you know, like e to the something. So there is some mismatch over there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this mismatch is understandable because, um, because the reason is because the Einstein model was too simplistic. And what was the simplistic thing in it? That each atom in a solid vibrates independently of the other. Now that is not possible, that is not realistic. As atoms are strongly coupled, if one atom is moving, it's going to you know, definitely impact the other one, and the other one is going to impact the other one. So basically they are all coupled. You know. So uh, modeling a solid uh, as independent, uh, independent oscillators was not a very good idea. You know. <clears throat> Then strongly, Einstein also assumed that all the atoms vibrate, vibrate with the same frequency. You, know. you remember this new, it is the same for everyone, and that's not a very general assumption. You know. So that's another problem over there. <clears throat> so then came Debye, I think that's how you pronounce the name. He went to the other extreme, you know, he said, well, a more realistic model would be he considered the atoms of a solid as a system of coupled oscillators having a continuous range of frequencies. He says they are all coupled, they are not independent, and they have a range of frequencies from zero to some maximum value. So basically he went to the other end, the other extreme compared to Einstein, and he said that a solid is a continuous elastic body. It is an elastic body, continuous elastic body. He considered it like that. And according to him, instead of the energy of a solid, I don't know how to say it. According to him, it's, uh, ah, according to him, internal energy, internal instead. Okay, I got it. According to him, in, uh, the internal energy of a solid, instead of residing in the vibration of individual atoms, resides in the elastic standing wave. These standing waves, you know, that's where it uh, resides. You know. So that's a big difference between the two. And these waves, like the electromagnetic waves, have energies quantized in units of h nu. Like quantum of an acoustic energy, which is the case over here, you know, because acoustic, because this elastic medium in the solid is called a phonon, P H O N O N, not a photon. For electromagnetic wave, you have photons, and like these acoustic standing waves, you know, you have phonons, you know. And the phonons travel with the speed of the sound, whereas the photons they travel with the speed of the light, you know. He assumed that a phonon gas has the same behavior as a photon gas. Because, anyway, or a system of harmonic oscillators in thermal equilibrium, so a system of, thermal, uh, a system of uh, harmonic oscillators in a given system in equilibrium, they're going to act as a bunch of phonons. And these phonons act in a similar way as the photons. You know. So basically what he was trying to say is that because they act the same way as the photons, and the photons are bosons, so he used both Einstein's statistics. You know. He said, well, 
the average energy per standing wave is going to be h nu divided by e h nu minus uh, one, which is the boson statistics, you know. <clears throat> That's what he used, and, and when he does his calculation, which we're not going to go over, the Debye super, uh, the Debye specific heat is your 9R4 theta by theta d cube, and it's integrated from 0 to theta d by t x cubed dx is the x minus 1, and this is your theta d by t and e theta zero t minus one. So obviously specific e is going to be temperature dependent and that's where your temperature dependent is coming over here. And theta d is your uh, uh, day by temperature I think and you call it h nu some new maximum divided by k where it's the maximum frequency. And it really gave very nice results you know. <clears throat> So anyway, thank you very much. This was one application of um, which I want to do about this specific each. And uh, then my next lecture, which will be lecture number, if this is correct, lecture number seven. Uh, what am I going to do? I don't know. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay. So next lecture, you know, uh, I will tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> I don't know exactly what I'm doing. Okay, thank you very much.